Hello, Matt. How's it going, Paul? I am still You're good. <laughs> so I'll... I see you got a friend there today. Yeah, it's, it's um. Some people might remember. This is Molly. I've got three cats. Um, some people might remember like a scene about a year ago when I was talking about Amplify. This was the cat that jumped across the screen, scratched my face mid live stream, and then I had like this blood mark go down the side of my eyebrow. <laughs> So, like, this is one of the reasons why I need to, to work in the cabin on the shed um, more often is, is I don't have children, but these cats drive me up for all during the day. If the wife's not home to take care of them. How's everyone going? Does anyone have cats? And uh, where have you joined from today? Well, I don't have I don't have any pets, actually, at the moment. Um, the, you know, my, my son has been asking about getting a, a, a hamster. Yeah. And um, a few weeks ago, we got like a, an enclosure for it, but we haven't actually gone ahead and, you know, got the hamster for it. But um, yeah, no, we have no pets. But yeah, any, anyone in the audience got any any specific pets? And um, yeah. hello to the audience. And where is everybody from today? Yeah. I've had dogs and cats. So at the moment, it's three cats, but it used to be three dogs. <laughs> it rotates around. Yeah, there we go. Muting the meetings, yeah. So I, I can't wait to move to my little private space. Yeah. So for anybody that's new, um, th this is our segment with Devs in the Shed. Um, it's for, you know, myself, Paul Kukil. I'm a solution architect at um, AWS. Um, and, and Matt is Matt Coles is uh, Principal Tam at AWS as well. Um, I know the show is about, you know, you know, a little bit about what's new with AWS that's come out during the last week. But uh, the primary goal is for us to like touch some of the technologies and and um, and explore some of the the features and options that are around there and um, listen to our you know our audience and what they want to see and how things integrate. Um, you know, Matt and I we we see a lot between the accounts and the, the customers that we work on, and I, I would say that like every single day, more than once a day, I see something that I didn't expect or I didn't really think of. Um, customers are using you know aws in ways that nobody can really imagine so you know being able to you know address some of those nuances around the products or explore certain um, you know edge cases or maybe you know as when we were talking about with you know with, with chalice and api gateway leveraging some of those services in ways that you wouldn't be expected to to use them for is interesting for us and um, as you can see like i'm in the shed here today matt is inside but he has a cabin that's being built specifically around this. But the idea of that is, you know, from time to time, we'll be doing some hands-on and a bit of IoT as well. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sort of outside and we we, we, um, we like to not just, you know, write code and use the, lose the cloud, use the cloud, but, you know, integrate some of those cloud services with, you know, IoT technologies. Yes, here's some pics of Matt's cabin. Yeah, here we go, I'll show you guys. So it's it's looking like it's in pretty good shape. It's wired up, but the the paint is in today. I'm not going to get it. Uh, I'm not going to get it painted. Actually, I decided to keep the wood look. So it's getting protective seals in the inside and the outside. Um, I think there's this is another good photo. It's just going to make working from home easier. I can do IoT in it, um, and uh, I think I'm literally like probably by the end of tomorrow I can move in. So that's kind of why I'm uh, I'm super super excited about it. Um, and it's it's well insulated and it's got really good like heating and cooling for the summers uh, because Melbourne um, is where we're both at and it can go from like freezing icy cold to like insanely desert sun related like heat <laughs> um, yeah. during summer. Well, well, so well, even yeah. now I can I'm feeling it today. So it's a, it's a little sunny today and it's it's warm. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's an absolutely perfect day today. Perfect to be outside, but it, it has been cold earlier in the week. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, let's, shall we go through the what's new? I was going to make a point on what you mentioned beforehand, but, um, you know, customers view us um, on the field as AWS experts, but like AWS is over 200 services now, right? And you've got customers that use things in every single way. So we're, we're actually constantly learning as well. So part of the reason why we have the show, I guess, is um, so we can learn a lot of the new stuff um, and people can kind of follow along with how we learn and play with things. Yeah, spot on there. Um, so, yeah, well, I'll bring up, like, the what's new for the week. And, uh, you know, there's, there, was a, there was a few things that came out, but um, I'll say this week, the last week, has not been 
anything that's that I'm like, you know, incredibly excited about. Um, and so, you, you know, it's, we'll, we'll probably spend a little bit less time this week going over what's new. Um, but I guess like the first one is Amazon Aurora now supports Postgres 13. Um, so for anybody that hasn't used Aurora, Aurora is our Postgres and MySQL compatible relational database engine. Um, so there is Aurora where you can, you know, set up a, a, a cluster that mimics, a, you know, a, a traditional relational database environment that's always on. But there's also a, a separate flavor of Aurora, which is Aurora serverless, which has the ability to um, scale itself up and down dynamically, but also scale itself so low that it actually will turn off um, if there is no, uh, you know, data transfer from that, that point. Um, and Aurora, you know, by some of our benchmarking is, you know, I think three times typically three times faster than Postgres, um, but it's completely Postgres compatible and for up to five times faster than uh, MySQL and also MySQL compatible. So I thought that was an interesting release. And it's extremely um, scalable as well, right? Like there's a lot of customers that are moving off of other, um, you know, large scale enterprise database technologies moving to Aurora with um, crazy workloads. So we, yeah. we, we do see like a lot of enterprise move to Aurora. Um, you know, like as as the backbone for um, their largest workloads and the, the craziest things that they get up to. But the the other side of it as well is, um, I, I don't think we give Dynamo enough credit, but Dynamo does some crazy amazing things with some of the largest workloads that we've got with our customers and and you know what we do um, AWS side ourselves as well. Yeah, and you know Dynamo has a event streaming off the back of like reads and write, I mean writes and you know inserts and updates. But, uh, you know, and, and when you think about dealing with a relational database and you have like triggers, so when something happens, when some data is updated or inserted, uh, Aurora has the ability to not just run the triggers within the, the database itself, but to be able to trigger external services such as Lambda. So, you know, you start to think about, um, you know, what you could, how that ties into the rest of your um, architecture and platform. And you start saying that, yes, even though I want a relational database as a central point, for the data that I'm putting on the platform, uh, that you know, trigger point or that real time action that you want to be able to take can now be like scaled off and put into you know, um, you know, external queues or external services where they need to be. So you know, th there's there's a lot of things that come with Aurora that are leading our customers to you know pick up this platform, um, as well as the cost advantages, cost and performance advantages that it comes with. Um, the next up, there was. And we spoke about this last week with the release of memory um, DB. So memory DB is a durable version, effectively a durable version of Redis. Uh, and so um, DMS, so our database migration servers, now supports Redis as a target. So that could be useful if you were needed something that was like incredibly high performance. Um, and I, I forgot the actual um, read and write times, but it's incredibly low from um, memory DB. But if you needed to, you know, think about moving like part of your database across, like the DMS would be the, you know, a tool that you would look at to help migrate some of that existing um, schema and data across into Redis. Uh, but secondly, you might even want to just use uh, DMS to do some replications and some, you know, continually move some of the data across to, um, you know, memory DB as a reflection of what was in your relational database or existing data store, whatever that might potentially be. Um, so, you know, I thought that was interesting that that came out and that was only two days ago that that was announced um, on our uh, blog. Um, and then, Matt, we did see like Copilot now supports PubSub architectures. So maybe I'll hand this one over to you because it yeah. wasn't exactly what we thought. Yeah, so when, when I saw PubSub and I think Paul did the same, we were just talking about like 10 minutes ago, we we're like, oh, does that mean that there's like WebSocket support for like the way that Copilot like builds up the environment for you or something. Um, Maybe just introduce Copilot as well. Matt. Yeah. So, so basically like um, when it comes to containers, um, you've got, uh, you know, ECS and EKS. Uh, EKS is Kubernetes, um, quite popular, of course. Um, then you've kind of got like the serverless driven version of containers where a lot of things are like taken away um, and abstracted for you. So you don't have to worry about them. Uh, when it comes to building out the environment and the network and managing and operationalizing and all of that. So um, Fargate's kind of an abstraction on top of that. Um, so you can just focus on developing, which is why I like it. So there was a need for um, a, a further layer of um, abstraction. Um, and we want to do an episode on Copilot at some point. 
Um, but the idea was like, how do we take everything away except for having developers need a YAML file and a, a simple CLI to interact with different services? So that's kind of where Copilot was born. And then the the way of proving out Copilot's really happened with the work um, that AppRunner has done. So AppRunner runs on top of Copilot, kind of showcasing um, what can be done um, very simply with um, with Copilot. But yeah, like we've done a lot on AppRunner on the show. Copilot is something that I think we need to explore more and and kind of like work out the unique benefits of that. I know a cus- yep. I know a lot of customers that have looked at AppRunner and they've said, um, you know, there's a couple of things that we'd like to see around database support and other things coming into AppRunner before we decide to adopt it within our businesses. Um, I think Copilot's going to open up to a lot of that stuff first, like in terms of access, and then that's going to downflow into AppRunner as one of the types of platforms that you can run. Um, you know, um, essentially. So it wasn't WebSockets. <laughs> I'll get to the point now. Um, it, it was uh, like we were trying to work out what, what that would actually mean because it didn't make much sense to us, but we we're always used to like PubSub being WebSockets. Um, what it turned out to be is that Copilot as a service um, now supports like tying into SNS and SQS. So I'm guessing we'll see something probably in the app runner scene on this as well. Um, so app runner, sh- you know, like hopefully we'll have this compatibility like come down into it as well. And then suddenly you can use SNS and SQS as services too. Um, so it's pretty neat. We will do a dedicated episode on it. We'll explore it with everyone um, because I'm sure you guys are as keen as us to kind of learn the ins and outs and it'll be a bit of fun. Um, with that being said, I think that was all the news that we had for this week, wasn't it? I know I tied really well. I was going to say, speaking of WebSockets, Matt, uh, you know, over to you and to what we were going to talk through and look at today. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we are going to have a look at AppSync. Um, if anyone is familiar with AppSync, um, AppSync's effectively like a GraphQL-based um, service, similar to like Apollo and a few other platforms. Um, but what it's done is it's really tightly integrated with AWS. Um, so you can talk to like Dynamo and RDS and, um, you know, a whole bunch of data sources out of the box. You can get HTTP endpoints for microservices or anything that you've crafted with, you know, basically whatever at that point. Um, but you can also talk to Lambda as well. So um, AppRunner, like <laughs> not AppRunner, AppSync is kind of like the single place um, that you'd go as like a front end developer to say, I want all this information and I don't want to have multiple API calls to collect all this information. Like, I want to know about the blog. I want the data, metadata on the blog. I want the blog article. I want the information about the author. I want it all back in the single post or the single query. And then AppSync's going to basically take it to all your data sources and gather up everything that's needed to build that query. And it's going to collect it all together. And then it's going to pass that back through to the developers, Jason. Um, a lot of people are using it as like a, like a, <laughs> hey, hey, um, Focus Otter. It's cool to see the Amplify teams on here. Uh, it's actually going to be Amplify and AppSync, uh, to be honest, yep. um, because I absolutely love um, <laughs> I absolutely love Amplify. It's my favorite service. So um, yeah, so we're we're going to kind of have a look at um, how this works. Um, we're using AppSync not just as like a query service. We're actually doing PubSub in the background with um, the app that Paul and myself have made. Um, but I've been talking to customers about it a ton. Like I, I literally have had. Like probably last week, I had three or four meetings about AppSync with different customers, and I had like three or four meetings on CDK with different customers. And some of the things that customers are doing with AppSync are pretty incredible, like building data lakes um, and using like AppSync as like the the entry point. Or what they're doing is they're using it as like an API gateway product, and they're basically using AppSync at the front and then tying in all their API sources in the background uh, to make it manageable, like when other services need access to these services. So it's pretty pretty verbose. Um, and that's what that's what we you know we we see when, I mean it'd be interesting if and we get any commentary from the audience if is anybody using GraphQL, and how have you found it different from like traditional REST, and and whether or not you're going through that process of migrating and moving across, because uh, you, you know there's so many, I mean there's the there's the back end for front end pattern that, that that we start to see at the moment where we're saying like, by by leveraging GraphQL. Um, and having like a set of resolvers that, describe, you know, that identify the resources that we have access to. Now, as a front-end developer, we just tell the back-end, I need this data. You go and figure it all out for me. And, and AppSync doesn't just necessarily connect that one API to one data source, but it has the ability to like effectively fan out to multiple different data sources and aggregate and pull things together 
and have um, rule and sets need... and manipulate the data. Like, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And where you have, uh, you know, there, there's a definable schema around that. And then there's the ability to extend on that to say, um, look, I need something like highly customized that is not a direct mapping to my data. Um, and if you, you know, if you've worked with, uh, you know, Apollo and some of these, you know, I, I worked with a customer that they have um, Apollo, um, Mongoose and, um, and uh, you know, MongoDB, like as, as their ORM. And they have a pretty strict mapping directly to the database. And, you, you know, when, when you think about that direct mapping of your API directly to the database, it, it becomes difficult and rigid because you're used to, you know, operating on those specific, like, entities that exist within the database. But a lot of the time, aggregation is what's required. And, um, you know, setting up some sort of aggregation with GraphQL, you can, like, I've seen it before, like, you can end up in this exponential amount of calls, back-end calls, or that are all existing and going into the database to try and aggregate data together. So the ability to extend that into Lambda is, like, you know, is really valuable as part of, you know, AppSync's offering. And, I mean, that's only been fairly sort of a recent um, announcement and enhancement to the to the platform, but um, yeah, for our application, it's like, and we say it as application, but we, when Matt is ready to bring up his screen, we'll see that it's a, probably a little more fun than just an application. Yeah, it definitely is. Let me let me get the game up. Oh, sorry, it's a game. Yeah, <laughs> we've been <laughs> we like to uh, we like to make little games. Um, sometimes sometimes like uh, you know like well, it's really just the example of the services. Sometimes you wouldn't really want to make a game. Uh, it wouldn't be really considered best practice to make a game sometimes with um, how we tie things together, um, but it's a really fun uh, way to learn. So uh, with that being said, what I'll do is I'll get up Firefox for everyone to see. And this is the this is the game that we've made. We're, we're actually making it into a bit of an internal workshop. It might become external maybe. Uh, it could be quite fun, um, but this is this is kind of like for an event that we've got coming up. And yeah, let's just have a look at Focus Otter's comment. AppSync also makes we're, WebSockets much simpler than traditional REST applications. Yeah, that's yeah, true. We're definitely we've definitely used WebSockets and subscriptions for for this application. And even just at a high level, it was just really simple to get this going. Yeah, um, the good call out is that API Gateway does now support WebSockets as well. So you've kind of got the choice between, uh, I guess. Um, you know, like if you want to use API Gateway or AppSync, AppSync makes it a ton easier. And I remember at my last job um, as a developer, um, like one of the complexities that we had to deal with was like WebSockets are complicated to manage effectively, especially when you've got a SaaS application and you need to produce SDKs for other um, customers to, to, to use. Like you got to follow like a, a proper pattern in the way that you work uh, with WebSockets. And it's not really, um, it's really a learning curve for some people that are, are, are very um, used to kind of like HTTP and REST um, protocols and just like building REST APIs with those. And so um, like we, we ended up probably spending about a year um, redefining and rebuilding our SDKs until it got to a point where it was, it was abstracted enough that everyone kind of used it following our best practice patterns. Um, but there was a large overhead like of everyone consuming um, you know, the web sockets that we produced at the very start. So it kind of overwhelmed some of the dev teams. So um, not really unique. This isn't really AWS specific, but it's one of the reasons why I do like AppSync because I find it really, really easy to work with and um, implement, um, you know, like really straightforward, simple web socket patterns for an application. So like I'll stop talking now. <laughs> what I might do is I'll just show um, what we've built, right? So we've, there might be a little bit of lag coming in from the streaming software, but you can see I've got um, myself here and on the other side, I've got Paul in the other browser. I can move both myself and Paul around. So how this is all working is effectively like Phaser.js is um, rendering to a canvas. So Phaser.js is like a, a JavaScript library um, for building video games. Um, it's pretty neat. Um, and then what we're doing is all the updates, like between two different browsers that I've got open on my computer, we're sending through to AppSync. Um, so we're we're kind of doing like a call to AppSync, and we're saying this is the current X and Y coordinates of is the it player. Possible to put the two browsers side by side and share your whole desktop map. Yeah, I can do that. It might be. Let Let me see. Hopefully, it's not going to be too awkward for everyone. 
but this this is it here, right? So it might be ultra long because I'm on a, a wide screen, and I know that doesn't really come across uh, fairly well on 1080p streams. Um, but yeah, I've got these two characters. Their movements are getting fed through um, AppSync. They're getting stored in DynamoDB. The reason why I said it's not exactly best practice is because um, usually when you're doing like real-time events and games, you want like a very quick, um, you know, very temporary cache system effectively to map coordinates. Whereas what we're doing here is we're relying on DynamoDB. And then DynamoDB is effectively, um, you know, alongside AppSync is effectively sending um, updates to both browsers. So we've got WebSockets kind of doing PubSub here. And the whole point of the game uh, at the end of the day is to collect all these little AWS services icons. And, you know, we'll go along the screen and we'll do that. So we'll kind of jump around the level, um, collect all the different services. And we're scoring behind the scenes, I think. Like, I don't think we've tied in the scoring part. So I thought we could do a little bit of that today. I need to flip the characters as well because they're walking... The, the point in the opposite direction as I move around. Um, but the idea is you'll kind of race the other player to pick up all these AWS services. And um, every 10, it respawns another 10. Um, and then we're going to put a timer on it eventually. So then the, the match kind of ends after a minute. And then whoever's uh, collected the most amount of AWS services um, will end up having the highest score and then they've won the game. So yeah, the whole, the whole point of this was just to show off a little bit of AppSync. Um, and we just thought it was a fun and unique uh, way to kind of present um, how to learn the service uh, back to customers. Anything to just add to show off a little bit of um, a little bit of Matt's uh, you know artistic skill there. So every every sprite, every tile, every graphic Matt drew by hand, except the AWS um, services, which were just icon exports. Yeah, they were icon exports. Yeah, so yep. um, you know it, it looks pretty nice, and you know it, it like all up, I think the code to build this whole game including the app sync, the subscriptions and everything was is probably like 300 lines of code some, something like that like it's it's actually like fairly minimal by using um uh you know phaser and so there's a comment here from focus focus order mm -hmm. it's not lagging is the front end react or vanilla javascript so the front end is like the, the library that's being used to render the game out and the game engine is phaser.js but everything there is is vanilla javascript that we've done um, and so when we've gone ahead and used the app sync components, and we'll, we'll, Matt will probably show those a little bit, we'll see that we have Webpack doing the translation between uh, anything that's ES6 or imports or exports um, and converting that back just using Webpack. But it's actually like very, very vanilla all the way through and very, very standard JavaScript, so it's not using React. But yeah, the, the lag, like what you saw there is, although Matt was hosting the application, the application itself locally, um, every single request and every single socket request is being called up and over the internet onto a WebSocket directly through AppSync and DynamoDB. So every time we move around, um, an event is being sent on the fly, and then the second um, screen is receiving those events and updating the coordinates of the other player. Um, and so that's how that's roughly like how it was working. Yeah, feel free to hit us up as well, Focus Otter, if you want to chat about it later. More than happy to uh, to have a bit of an internal conversation if you're from the Amplify team. Um, I'll take everyone through a little bit of the code to start with, just so you can kind of get familiar with how we've done things. Um, Paul's done the majority of the code lately, so we've been working over the last couple of weeks on this. I did a bit of the game stuff at the start, um, and then we've had a couple of like combined uh, peer coding sessions over the weekend to make this as well uh, last weekend. Um, effectively, like we are, if you look at it, we are using Amplify, and then we're using AppSync uh, underneath that with Amplify. So we're loading in um, the Amplify libraries. Uh, we've got the AWS config. So what we did is we effectively ran like an, um, you know, an, an Amplify uh, configure, configured the AWS environment, uh, an Amplify init to initialize Amplify into the project. Uh, and then we just did a Amplify add API and selected GraphQL. And that basically is all that we needed to do on the Amplify side to get this working. And then what Amplify did, which is really cool, was um, it generates a schema for you. And so like this is usually just a generic schema, but then we we change the schema to match like what we want to do with our game. So we feed in a game ID. That way we've got the concept of a game session. Um, you can give the game a title if you want as a label. And then we had like player one and player two, and we made those JSON objects. And that meant that we could feed in like X, Y. Um, if I can be bothered doing animation for it as well by the time, 
um, I'll put in the animation state as well. Like, so I'd have a sprite sheet and in that sprite sheet, I basically have, um, you know, like five, five animations for walk. And so I could say which, which, um, image or watch PNG maps to the, the state of walk for that character. And so we can kind of have the characters animated if I have time to do that, um, which is pretty cool. The other thing that we do need to add in is the score. Um, but every time I change this, I can actually do like an amplified push and that's going to change the back end. So it's going to build stuff in DynamoDB. It's going to set up AppSync properly for me, which is really, really nice. And um, on the other side of that, it does generate this folder for GraphQL. And so this this is pretty cool. This is like one of the benefits of using Amplify versus just using the AppSync, um, you know, NPM package. Um, it generates all the variations of the queries that you might potentially have and all the mutations, so the create, re, uh, create and updates and deletes. Um, it generates all those and and allows you to access them within your um, within your code base, and then it also does that for subscriptions if you want to use WebSockets as well. So when I go back into the game scene, you can see that I'm loading um, the things from the GraphQL folder that I need, the mutations and the subscriptions, and underneath of that, I basically do an amplify configure uh, once the game scene's been loaded and um, loaded up and ready to fire off. I load in the AWS exports, which just has like the endpoint for AppSync and API key and a few other things. So I'm not going to open it on the stream, um, but that's all generated um, by Amplify as well. Like when you set up the API, the, and... that, that um, th there is nothing secret in the AWS exports. So even though there is a key in there, um, that that is compiled into the or transpiled into the application JavaScript application. So we, we've we've had a there is a key, but it is a, just a public key that says. If you've got that key, you can call our API. So we have no authentication on this API in the same point. Uh, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, I always play it safe. But um, yep. yeah, and then what we've done is like we've basically referenced the API library uh, with an amplifier, and we are creating a game session. So we're mapping like um, game data. Um, we're loading in like player two and a few other things. And then underneath that, we've got like where the events kind of fire off. So. So here you can see in the create movement update, like where we're, we've got like a hard coded game ID to start. Um, we've got a game title that's like half um, hard coded as well at the moment. Um, those things can be dynamic if we make the lab open to a whole bunch of people and have just a simple box that people can type in the game ID or game session. We might randomly generate a game ID with like a, the UUID uh, NPM package but then people could give it a title as well and they could give that title to their friends to join games if we open it up a bit more um and then um you you effectively like in here you send the movement updates so like the players x y um and all that stuff in here so that's kind of the json object that goes back into app sync and um and dynamo and then i think underneath this we didn't want to. We didn't want to kind of like. Um, we didn't kind of want to send movement updates all the time because we we knew that could be quite heavy. So what we did is we had to compare movement to see if the keyboard and mouse had been um, you know pressed down and the player's X or Y coordinates had been shifted. So um, so we've got our compare movement code here. And then like whenever whenever we have detected movement, we then call that little function that we've made within an, uh, within the class. So then we send all that data to AppSync effectively. So that was one of the ways that we made the game a lot faster um, and the interactions with AppSync and the updates um, a lot faster as we just sent the data that was needed versus having it fire constantly, which is what we happen, what we happen to have in the first iteration of the game. And the other thing was we actually, in the game's config file for Phaser, um, we set the, the frames per second down to 25 as well. And that way we're limiting um, the updates per second of the actual game and what's being rendered and how things are being managed uh, to only iterate over 25 um, frames a second, even though my monitor uh, supports like 144 frames a second and uh, the graphics card could do a lot higher than that. We, we did notice like there were too many events firing with people that, um, that had graphics cards that could put out like 3,000 frames of this really simple app. Um, per second. So um, the other thing, I think, um, actually here, this is the subscribe, isn't it, Paul? So this is where we're getting the WebSockets back. 
yeah so, sorry i was on mute yeah i just was just saying like go to line 15 where we do the subscription yeah so, that's what i was looking so basically for basically that says yep. yeah go ahead and, and subscribe to to that endpoint and when there are updates listen to those um, updates that are happening um you can see there that like this is this was a fun game right and so we've used like global variables such as window.player like that hasn't been refactored out because we've just been you know hacking through it on the weekend but effectively we say on subscribe to this graphql endpoint and every time there is an update every time we receive an update through the websocket then go ahead and update the like this variable that's the player two and player two now has the coordinates of where the player two has been put up to and then within the game loop, and the game loop is you know looping 25 times per second, it says, has there been a change in where player two is? Uh, actually, no, it doesn't even say that. It just says, move player two to where it should be. So it just constantly moves it all, all around and follows the, the X and Y coordinate of the event that has been sent through. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, so that, like, if we look here, we say the, the amount of code that was required to build something that enables us to do store and be able to replay the game events within DynamoDB, have WebSockets, subscribe to those WebSockets and be able to push in endpoints. You do that all with GraphQL and provision all the infrastructure was literally like, what was it like? Amplify in it. Um, yeah, it's like the, the four lines at the top, right? And then- Yeah, the four like lines, maybe... paste in that schema file yep. and then, you know, 12 lines of code or something there. And, and we've got like the ability to have like real streaming data, uh, real time data being pushed in and out on websites or near real time data. Yeah, so it's pretty awesome. What I, what I might do is I might actually show what it looks like in the console, because you know part part of this was like let's let's continue working on it, but the other part is like uh, I thought it's like worth kind of taking people through what we've been working on. Um, we might do it as a workshop for everyone later on. Um, yeah, we mentioned that we're doing this as an internal uh, workshop, um, but there's no reason why it couldn't be external. So um, that could be something fun to do in the future. But basically, like in terms of like what's happening in the, the back end when you do like an amplify push um, is, or an amplify init is like on, on the initialization side, like you set up your amplify project so this is uh, this is my amplify project. When I run the add apply add API command, it adds in an API here, which is pretty cool. Um, we we did actually a deployment. So like we're working in development at the moment, but we did an amplify uh, publish and ad, amplify add hosting command, and that allowed us to set up CloudFront for a really distributed um, web URL that we could give people, and then we gave that a nice domain name as well. So, um, so like Amplify has allowed us to do a lot of things really, really simply. Um, we could tie it into GitHub for continuous integration, continuous builds as well. So as we change the source code, if we've got Amplify add hosting in, um, we could um, simply like have the build happen and then all of that um, compiled and then, um, well, not really compiled, but, you know, all of that, um, all of that sent up, built and hosted on AWS and then rolled into that CloudFront URL that we uh, set up with Amplify the, hosting. Yeah, there, there are build steps. So it's like NPM run build, which does the transpilation, but you can go ahead and run customized build steps as part of that deployment process in Amplify as well. Yeah, and then like a little more around what's actually happening is, you know, like if we, everything is like uh, infrastructure as code or code as infrastructure, as I say, dyslexically sometimes, um, but like, you can see that like, you know, in the Amplify subfolder in my project, if I was to screen share that, like what it's doing is it's generating like uh, cloud formation um, that's going to generate all the resources that's needed on the AWS side. So it's kind of obfuscated that a little way from um, app developers, but we can modify the cloud formation if we want to eventually. Uh, we can see what's produced in this as well. We can move it between accounts fairly easily as well. So we could have a UAT account, a dev account and a production account. Um, but it's generating all these different resources within the AWS account for us. So I can actually see those resources get deployed. I can see those resources get created. And that means that like, if I go into AppSync um, as a service, let's wait for it to load. Um, I can go into my Amplify game. This is a bit of a fresh account. And what I can do is I can see the schema that was set up as part of the AppSync deployment. So I actually didn't have to know about any of this as a developer. 
but it's all created within um, the AWS uh, console, the AWS account. I could retrieve it with a CLI if I wanted to. Um, and it's done all this heavy lifting for me to basically like build out AppSync so that um, you know we can have our Amplify game and it's got the uh, the schema that I want to use. And then of course, um, you know, the data source behind the scenes here is this um, DynamoDB table. So if I go into that now, I always like showing the behind the scenes stuff because I think it's important like as developers to, to only have to worry about what you're working on right now, but it's worth being aware of like what's happening behind the scenes, um, you know, as, as your app develops and you want to get more hands on with the console side. Um, I do see a lot of uh, developers lately use like Amplify combined with CDK um, to build their projects as well. And CDK kind of allows them to have a bit more control around the assets that are generated. But the Amplify CLI is, is just really, really easy to get started with. So if I view items in this, this I can is see... This new DynamoDB interface, by the way. I think yeah, yeah, I was, I was just like, where's the so. button now? <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah, so so in here, um, these are all the updates that we're feeding into Dynamo. Um, like, if I go into one in particular, you can see, like, we've got that JSON object, XY, loop count, all those things are being fed in there and then returned um, back as JSON. So here we go. Like, that's that's a better example of, like, what's returned. Um, but it puts it into form. So it's creating all these things in Dynamo, and then AppSync is feeding back through subscriptions back into the application. So that, that's kind of like a little bit of a, a peek behind um, the scenes here, uh, which is nice to see. Now, what I wanted to do was actually, do we want to walk through the rest of the code, or do we um, yeah, do we want to try and add the look. scores? Yeah, let's just have a quick look through the rest of the code. There isn't a lot there, and uh, and if everybody if anybody noticed, like there's long long numbers there of the x and y coordinates and if anybody in the audience has dealt with maths and javascript you you know that like sometimes maths and javascript can be fun um, and we we actually had a glitch or a bug the other day where when we're sending the coordinate through it's slightly move up and down like just just constantly and it ended up being some sort of maths problem with javascript that sometimes i guess the engine when it's trying to work out the x and y coordinate wasn't quite right Actually, you can see it there on line 48 and 47, like maths.seal, making sure that um, we were flattening that out. Like, it's not, we don't need to be so precise in this specific game, but to eliminate that that issue was because, you know, JavaScript was, the maths was just slightly going up and down, just a tiny little bit, which was making the, the character moving up and down just a little bit all the time. Yep, yep. But yeah, let's go through the code, mate. Yeah, so we do a preload with Phaser. So, um, you know, like, actually, let's walk one step back, right? Like, Phaser has this starting project, right? Like you, you kind of give it like a configuration, like you, what you want to do with Phaser. That allows you to set up like physics so things can like interact and collide with each other. Like, you know, we had the items bouncing on the floor um, and then they kind of settle down on the floor eventually. You know, the player shouldn't be able to float through the level. They should be able to hit like the, the different blocks that were made in the level as well. So all of that happens through um, the physics and the colliders that are set up there. And there's a couple of different ones. Um, like by default, what a video game does is it draws a, a block, like a, a rectangle around, you know, the the widest and the highest and lowest points of the characters. Um, but then you can get more defined with that. Like you could go like for an exact match of everything by the opacity. You could draw a polygon, like a series of points around a character as well. Um, so the physics side is quite interesting. Um, but that's kind of like how we interact with the world at the end of the day. Um, frames per second was, um, you know, to allow us to have some control over the frame rate and make things really smooth with app sync. Um, then you can set like how big it should be in the browser, whether it's full screen, um, whether you're using like WebGL or Canvas or whatever you can set here too. Um, zoom, pixel art. Pixel art basically adds a sharpen to it. So so usually like, um, you know, when, when you have this off, um, pixel art is really, really small. So it's going to kind of increase it and it's going to be really blurry. But then you use a particular sharpening filter to to make sure that like as you scale the character, like um, they aren't going to look pixelated and um, and a bit of a well they, they are going to look like pixelated <laughs> pixelated characters because they are pixel characters, but they're not going to look blurry is what I'm trying to get to. Um, uh, underneath that we basically have two scenes right. We have that title where you select characters, so we've built that, and then we have the game scene, which is like where the level is, where all the logic is, where all the events happen and the fun stuff. And we add those scenes to the game. And then we start with the title scene. 
and we also load in that configuration into the phaser so it knows how our environment should be set up. Um, now, maybe what I'll do is I'll jump to title scene very quickly. But um, in this, effectively, all that we've got is like a couple of buttons with images assigned and then some text, right? Like it's very simplistically at the end of the day. So what we do is we preload those um, pictures in. Um, so you can see we've got an images folder up here. Um, and, you know, like we can see our, our little characters. Um, so we load those in. Oh, did I shut down? I did. So we load those in in the preload. Um, then what we do is we create a player button and we center it. So we've got a bit of code to add a button to the screen. And then we we basically like call the create um, method. And that effectively allows us to um, assign like a texture and where, and where the buttons should sit and call these little like button methods or button classes. Um, so like we so put one in like, form. Yep. Yeah, that's just like copy and paste two buttons, right? Like literally that's yeah. what we do. We said like here's the two buttons and the button should look like the character Paul. And when I click Paul, just, you know, start this game scene and set a variable of which player I am. Yeah. And the reverse if it's Matt. So very, very simple. Set the position, set some text to it. Like what does the text say? So that's all fairly simple stuff, right? And then what we want to do, and this is what like sometimes it's a little bit difficult in app development, but it was quite easy with Phaser, is like you, you then pass to the scene and sometimes you might have some context passed to the scene as well. So like we pass, we don't we don't pass context in this example because what we're doing is we're pl the player that's select is actually going to the window context to the browser. Um, but generally like you might have like, uh, you know, like window.player blah, 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 fed through. And then when the game scene's loaded and that game class is loaded, it knows that Paul was selected, so Paul is what should be rendered and pointed to for this particular object. Um, yeah, so that's the title scene. I uh, won't need to save that. Then the game loads. Uh, da, 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 da. So we go into the game scene, and you can see we've done the same thing. So you load images. Um, we've got like an array of services here as well. Um, you know, they're associated with these services, and that way we can randomly spawn different, spawn different services rather than having to point to each individual image that we've loaded up when we want to call it. Um, then you go into create. So after preloading all the textures and pre-building this kind of like array or dictionary or whatever, um, you go into create. And then we've got like a couple of like, you know, global context kind of stuff for this particular scene. Um, so like we look at the loop counts, we've got like a UID for randomization we have a left boundary and a right boundary. Um, so this is like how far the items should spawn either side because the levels are set size. Um, we could, like if we wanted to be smarter, we could have actually looked at like the level bounds. Um, and I'll show you the level file in a little bit, but we could have had a look at the level bounds and calculated that ourselves too. Um, so we could make it more dynamic if we wanted to add in more levels. Um, yeah, and then we, then we load in the tile map. So the tile map, is effectively like the level itself and the textures that are associated with, with each position on the level. So maybe it's a good time to quickly look at that. So um, if I go to levels, I've got the sprite sheets. So these are the textures that I made. We actually made it for another game with Aaron. Um, so if Aaron's watching the stream, like we, we, we worked on these textures together over a weekend um, for Western Defenders, which is a game that we built in Pygame. A um, couple of weeks back, so I've kind of like borrowed from that and um, the textures that I made here, basically are 36 pixels um, square each. And then what the game does is it effectively divvies that up for us. So, um, so like in in um, in the level.json, it sets like the tile size for each picture, and then so it slices this into a sheet. So like each of these is like got a different um reference points so like this could be texture uh one nothing would be zero so the it does start the index at zero but it means that it's like transparent to see through and then you go two three four five six and then it just keeps it arranged down the rows like that so the level um file was actually made in a tool called tiled map editor um, but what it does is it exports this uh very complicated but not so complicated um 
JSON file. And that JSON file basically goes like, there's three layers to our game. Um, what we're doing is we're snatching texture 28 um, for this um, first layer, the underneath layer. And if we go back to that image, um, texture 28 is actually just the sky. So what it's doing is it's laying down across the entire board um, sky in the first layer. Um, so, um, so it's kind of like laying down the sky, which is why everything equals 28. So it's the 28th texture. And then this one here is, so four, five, and six. So what that actually does is that maps back to like um, the, tile, the tile sheet here. Like these would be like, some of these textures would be four, five, and six. And so like this will be an edge piece, this will be a middle piece, and this will be the opposite side of an edge piece. And so this is actually making that level with the multiple height platforms that we saw before. And then zero basically means don't display anything. Um, and then if we go to the third layer, this is kind of like rather that this is the level geometry layer. The third layer is really the items layer. So um, in here, most things are zero. But if I added in like something that I wanted to be passable for the player, so I don't I don't put physics on this layer. Um, but this could be like a little cactus, or it could be a little image in the background that I put for the player. The player can walk along. The player is always going to be in front of this, um, but the player is not necessarily going to collide with this. So that's kind of like the level JSON that we put together. Um, you can see a couple of objects here, right? 14, 18. And so those would be like that cactus, that little letter post, some grass, um, as we saw beforehand. And then um, what else? Let's see. So in the game scene, uh, we then have once we've loaded the the level, so you can see like the third layer of, of the, yeah, actually here we go. So this is the sky layer, that first layer that we looked at. The third layer, the one that we looked at last, is the decoration layer, is what I've called it. So that's the stuff that the player can pass through, and then like the ground layer is a dynamic layer that has collisions set up, and so anything that's rendered in this layer is effectively um, something that the, the player can collide with. So that's kind of how we're doing that logic um, yeah, between that, the two layers. That's the actual ground and all of those platforms, right? Mm. Yeah, that's right. Maybe what I'll do is just before we move on to the next part, I might just reshare um, just in case anyone's come into this, the stream. So like this is what I was talking about beforehand. So like I can pass through the grass, cactus, the, the lamppost. Like I can pass through all these things, but I can't pass through any of the things that I've mapped to tile. So I've built a fake wall, but I can jump on top of like the platforms. And so that's kind of how I handled all that logic. That's what I was talking about. And the sky is actually like lots and lots of tiles in the background as well, but that's all passable. And that's like what I've, what I've rendered as the first layer. And, um, and of course, in this example, um, we've kind of gotten all the tile layers and then like we've put the players at the very front as well. So that's why they don't go behind things. But if I wanted to, I could have created another layer um, that I might have as a front layer. And then when I walk through the pole, like I'll still be able to walk through it, but it'd show in front of the character as well if I wanted to. So yeah, uh, hopefully let, let us know what you think in the chat on, on this. Uh, it's been a really fun project to work through. But we'll just touch on the last of the code very quickly. So I'll just pop this back up for everyone to see. So we're reading the window event from the title screen to work out like which player to render. Um, so if the player selected was Paul, then Paul is here. Now you might notice that um, the logic at the moment is um, not really detecting whether Paul's already been selected or not. That's something that we'd build in as we expanded upon this as well. So two players could play Paul theoretically at this point in time, um, but that's one of the things that we need to work through. And then what we do is, um, you know, we render the sprite, we set this player as this particular player object, which can be used for collisions and everything else and movement, and we can give the instructions to. Uh, you also set the gravity as well, because if you don't set the gravity, the player is going to be floating around, and we wanted the player to um, hit the tiles um, that were underneath of him or her as a player, and then be able to move around. So I'll just scroll down a little bit. We've got a camera. The camera is set to follow the player. 
you can see the collider so this is this is like we we had that collision um you know physics mesh for the scene um basically like it goes th these two things need to interact with each other so they go into the colliders um the camera follows the play around as i said before and then what we do is we drop a bunch of goodies so we've got this goodies class um that's underneath and the goodies class like it, it basically takes that like um array that we had of aws services and then it basically like randomizes that array and then it puts physics on them and then it drops them down to the floor and the player can then uh, go ahead and pick them up later is there anything that you wanted to mention on that um point first paul maybe no i think that like you, you know it, it's it's reasonably simple there we draw all these items on the screen and then we drop 10 goodies um yep. and at later in the point in time when all of those you know items are gone we go ahead and we do that again so like that's the that's the setup for the code yeah yeah so i might just in the interest of time I might scroll down um so the final thing is like you you have your preload for loading all your textures your sound effects your music you have your create to, to spawn what's going to be used in your level and then the last part of file is uh the last part of phaser is you have your updates and so this is like this is like a real-time loop and this is what i love about game engines because it's very similar <laughs> like i I've, I've played game engines since i was like you know tiny basically like a like a midget tiny child thing um like i i love the fact that like this loop is constantly executed and then all the things that need to update basically feed back into that loop like it makes it really simple to work out like what's happening in my game state it can get complex um you know as you as you go down the track and you add heaps of players and there's like people shooting each other in a video game there's lots of like um you know events that might happen like cutscenes that might like pop up dialogue for text between characters it gets more and more complex and that's kind of when game engines come into the picture so phase is kind of like a framework for making a video game um you know like pi game which we looked at a couple of weeks ago and um you can watch our youtube actually maybe maybe link to the pi game if people want to see like the yeah, little western shooter one. that we've got um because we kind of use youtube as an archive to the uh to the the um the twitch streams but um you know like pi game is very similar it's kind of like a framework um to build your game it's very simplistic it lets it lets you do most things so you've got control over it um, but a game engine is more about like now you've got very complex scene with many different things happening in your video game it basically has like a scene editor that comes along with it and then that scene editor manages like the complexity of how the update loop cycles around and and where players should be placed and what should be happening in the game and this and that so um so you don't really see it but every game engine's got this as well it just like kind of obf obfuscates that away from the end player but in the in the update now now all the interactivity happens right so like basically like we've got this um if here to let's see what is this doing this is adding adding the sprites in and setting the positions of the the players so that they drop down um then every time there's an event an input that's come from the keyboard like if w s uh, a or d or was um is what I should probably like re rejig that to be. Um, whatever keys are pressed there um, should be tracked as events, and then we can access to make the character like move around. So what we do is we load in this arrow key object, and then like if the left arrow key is down or W, um, oh no, sorry A, um, what we do is we set the player's velocity to move um, to the left of the scene if I get my uh, bearings right. And then if um, right's held down or D, um, then the character's going to have uh, velocity set the other way. So they're going to move the other way. And if we had animations, like what we'd do is we'd also call in, like the, we'd update the animation state to say, play frames three to five on our sprite sheet, very similar to the texture sheet. And so that would kind of set where, you know, like each of the animations. So you might have like walk up the top, you might have like um, jump, you might have shoot or a few other things here as well we did that in the western defender game actually um but like what it will do is we'll go like okay so these player these animations are going to loop until the player has stopped pressing the uh the a button on the keyboard uh, to walk left so we map um all those states down here um jumps a little bit different so jump what we do is we set a velocity on it 
and that velocity is actually rather than an x velocity they're moving upwards so they're going on a y coordinate and so the player gets that velocity set and then what we do is we kind of iterate that down so like once once the arrow keys um stop being pressed um jumping's gonna stop but what we also do is we have a life cycle where um you know as as the player if they keep holding the button down they won't just keep flying up until they let go like what we do is like that jump happens and then like the physics is going to suck them down but they can't constantly hold the button down to continuously move um so you can kind of like um kind of like have like a five second counter that removes velocity until <clears throat> that velocity is fully gone and then the the back to standing you can do cool stuff like you double jumps as well use a jump to fly right yeah yes yeah, so you can't, jump can't use the jump to fly. Can't fly yeah but but what you could do is you could have a double jump right so if if um d is pressed velocity set on d you could like have d's velocity reset and then like power down for your you know like your calculation to to get back to zero on the y velocity so that's how you do double jumps on games as well which is pretty cool um and yeah and then the last thing is like what we do is we within the the game loop we're actually feeding back to like app sync like whether the player's moved or not so this this is kind of where we call that compare movement function that we looked at beforehand so each each time each time like the game loop plays 25 frames a second at the moment that compare loop is going to be looked at and then if x or y is different for either of the players then it's basically going to feed that back um to graphql so that both people can see their updates um within the scene as they move the characters around um collect service so that's the dropping the 10 goodies um so that's the other thing that we do call um and so that drops like all the different aws services that will give the player points and that's pretty much it so yeah it was like 207 lines of code um some uh texture work some level creation work um, but you can see, like, we learned app sync over. How how long do you reckon we've probably spent on this? Like, maybe, how many maybe hours? eight. Yeah, how many hours? Probably like eight, maybe, maybe more. Yeah, so, something like eight hours. I've probably spent that much time trying to put together a, a working lab. You know, that's probably spent more time with that. Um, but yeah, I, 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 it didn't take us that long in actual time to do it. And that was like this was the first thing that I've ever built. Like, I'm a complete novice to Phaser. I've never seen it before yeah so yeah pro probably eight hours we, we built the whole thing like and that was figuring out how to you know get it all packaged up with webpack and bring amplify in alongside phaser and make all of that work together yeah like um mo most of the time would have been on phaser as well just making the video game logic but like bringing in amplify probably took like an hour tops maybe like including like bringing in app sync um one of yep. one of the complexities that we did do like was like we're passing between the canvas and um effectively like uh the app sync side of the equation so that that meant like that's why we're using like the window events but there's probably a nicer way to do it um but you know at the, like at the time when we first built that it hasn't been refactored out we had this very separate so all mm. the um app sync and amplify pieces were embedded into the front page of the html they weren't part of the game engine so like that, that could all be refactored out and would work it would work fine now yeah, yeah. and so like it, it was fairly dirty yeah yeah and you can see like within within like the index.html like you know like we've got a style sheet like embedded in here the viewpoint uh viewport but like all that we're doing is we're loading in the phaser library so you don't pull this down with like you know an npm install um, you embed directly in the browser and then what we do is we set the id on where our game's gonna appear so that like when we go into our phaser game like the parent class is mega game so it knows where to place um the game inside that html file yeah. and then so that, that's, that's also like why react. that's where it injects itself back in yeah and and that's why we've got the web pack as well like because um you know we need to do a build of all the resources here and paul paul like this 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 probably took like about an hour you had some some things where some assets weren't appearing to be accessible um after webpack had run so there are some complexities here as well so like yeah, i well, think I that's your patterns kind of... for like for years like it had been years since i've touched webpack, well, well like so... react usually gives you a webpack from scratch right like and you yeah. don't even have to worry it's like they're already like yeah. most things are tracked like the directory structures pre-built so you don't need to worry about any of this 
Um, so literally, like uh, Webpack sort of things that goes in my, I don't really need to learn at the moment for camp, but I'll Google if I run into any problems. So I think that was the same for Paul as well. And um, and so, yeah, we, we worked out how to load in the asset folders, which took a little bit. Um, was there anything else in terms of magic in the Webpack file you wanted to talk about? Um, no. I think that, that what made this really handy, and I sort of, like building a game, like you do do a lot of reloads all the time. So and making sure that hot reloading was working here worked really well. Um, and secondly, we also I have all of this working in Cloud9, so you don't need to do it locally. So there's very minimal amount of dependencies that are required to make this work. So yeah, yeah. it was it was fairly easy. Um, Focus Otter asked the question: Are the phaser docs a good starting point or some other tutorial? I, I'm pretty sure that like I went through the phaser docs. Yeah, we, we didn't we didn't buy a course. We uh, we we didn't buy anything on Udemy. Um, we didn't really we didn't really look at tutorials either, right? I, I think there was. Let, let me let me share my browser. Um, just just so everyone can kind of see our learning journey around this because we hadn't really used Phaser before. So because Phaser Matt had a because Matt had a history in um, gaming. He knew how the engines worked, so that was because they all use the same logic, came right? Across. Yeah. Yeah, he, all of that, all of that domain knowledge came across immediately. For me, it was harder because I was like, I, I didn't understand how it worked. But um, I'll share your screen Matt, with the phase of docs. Yeah, um, yeah, cool. But yeah, we, like we picked, I picked some tutorial here that was some like really basic thing. I think it might have been that very first game. I was like, oh, okay, now I see how it's working. I started changing out bits and pieces, and then after a while, you just sort of you do become comfortable with it. Then like the big, the big leaps are when you start saying, all right. I know how to customize my game a little bit, but now I want to put in a second scene. Now I um, got to have a bit of familiarity with how to build like the level maps. Um, and then thinking, you know, because you're still getting comfortable with this, like how, how easily does existing JavaScript or existing hooks work and putting that into phaser. And, and at the end of the day, it was like, it, it worked really well, but at the start when we were first pulling, um, you know, app sync and amplify in, it was, we kept it like very, very separate, and that's why we were using window to pass things around. We knew what we were doing was not great, but um, you know, we, we were just sort of getting a hang of what we we're doing. And, and you know, yeah. not there's not too much out there that talks about like how to go ahead and set something up like this. Yeah. So like this, <coughs> this was the phase of tutorial, right? I pasted a link in the chat for everyone. But like it teaches you load the asset, world building, platforms, player, adding physics, keyboard controls, scores and all of that. And then basically after that point, we were straight into the API documentation. Um, now, th like w that's that's how we kind of extended upon that. Now, I, I do have a friend from my last work. Um, he's based in Atlanta, so he's not over in Australia with us, but um, uh, Scott Westover. So he he kind of has a quick tutorial as well, um, which is quite nice, uh, just on how to change levels. Um, which wasn't as straightforward as we we could have gathered from um, the docs, so I did uh, I did kind of like leverage some of his stuff that he'd built, um, you know, that uh, I knew he'd built from the last place. I followed his tutorial as well, just some level loads, and then the rest was kind of like um, just kind of understanding like how video games work as a whole. Um, so you know they all kind of use the same principles. So I think the rest came with. Um, you know, understanding how physics works is probably something that most people need to get their heads around at the start. Um, how to get a tile map showing. So um, um, let me see if there's anything good here. Um, Phases has an example repo with a whole bunch of like different examples for tile maps and stuff. Um, but this was like just basically like how to make a level as a JSON file. And then like what you'd find is like tiled editor um, which is used across many different game engines is a really good um, tool that allows you to export a CSV or a JSON file. Most games uh, engines support it out of the box. It allows you to lay out the tiles and then have like the different layers. And then you can also set like properties to each of the tiles as well. So you can track those properties within the JSON file within your game file. So like you can say actually like whenever someone walks over the potion that I've got, um, this potion script supposed to fire up, and they and they get like more health or they get more mana or something like that. So tiled is really really cool too. Um, yeah, that that was pretty much it. I, I, we were going to build the scoring in, but I think we we got carried away showing um, 
you know like how everything came together so i think hopefully that was interesting for everyone um maybe maybe what we can do is we can do another stream when we add in um scoring, scoring in, unless we run out of time and we need it in the lab asap um that could be interesting um yeah but yeah but um yeah like definitely focus um hit, hit us up internally and um we can we can chat about that and for anybody else like you know if this was an interesting topic and you'd like to see us do the scoring we, we'd like to to hear that if you don't and you prefer us to go back to you know more aws native pieces let us know that as well yeah um, i'd love to do a session on amplify sometime as well like we've done aws yeah. chalice like we haven't really fully looked at like app sync and like you know a, faca a facade pattern i can never say that word properly um but like amplify as well like we could look at like native ios flutter uh react react native type stuff which might be interesting for people that are building apps that want to access the cloud services really fast really easily i'd, yeah. I'd love to take you guys through that as well because that's it's uh it's like my day day job <laughs> basically and, and yeah amplify has come such a long way that like you, you know we, we built this on one machine and then i needed to port it and bring it all down i know that a year ago that gives you a bit of chills like it was it just didn't it just wasn't as slick and smooth as it is now and effectively i just did the same thing you amplify configure um amplify pool with the special specific id for that application that i deployed in this account and then all of those things came back down and I continued to work on my application as I was locally. Um, when yeah. I needed to go ahead and change that, um, that um, uh, you know, the schema, like uh, for the GraphQL, for, for the models there, you know, we just alter the schema, um, amplify, push, and then it goes ahead and reconfigures all of that code for me. So a lot of that CRUD work is being taken out. One of the other interesting things that I think some people struggle with as well is like multi-team, multi-environment projects as well so we can run through some of the learnings that we work with our customers yep. on on this you'd be you'd be surprised like a lot of people a year ago would have said like you know amplify is mostly for startups but like it's matured like quite massively over last year um we've got really good patterns for how multiple people can work on the same code base you know you can do a git pull and then an amplify pull um you can pull a particular environment so you can set multiple environments for dev uat and uh and this and that um for your builds and then there's also like um, you know like multi-account for multi-environment type patterns as well, which which really help you to, to deploy consistently, but with like a few varying things across each of the environments. Like you know production might have CloudFront, but you don't really want to have CloudFront in your non-prod. You just want like a um, you know a URL that you can call um, you know, and you just want things set up on a simple S3 bucket that you can kind of internalize to your particular environment. So yeah, that, that's all the fun stuff. Some of the really nice stuff that I've seen with my customers, and some of them have been like, you know, largish customers, have said, you know, we're we're still transitioning through like modernizing our stack, but we need to host something on front end. Amplify does a really good job of doing that, and we want our staging environment to be protected by a password. Like, you know, if you if you're very you know standard and you think about Eng uh, like Nginx or Apache and password protecting that and configuring files, that's all really difficult amplify like that's just comes out of the box for you the ability to customize your builds deploy off different branches you know you've got yeah. pipelines automatically so there's, there's a lot of nice features that come with it yeah and I, th I think going from the startups last year like now now like most of my day like i'm part of the the, the technical field community for for amplify so basically like we just help the community when it comes to anything that comes up with app sync or amplify uh which is why i'm quite passionate about it but i haven't talked about it on the show until now like one of the things is like the number of enterprise using it, it's like greatly increased, right? Like a lot of people are using it for production level apps that are like delivering, you know, food orders in real time to people like by the millions. Um, you know, like you've got people that are using it for like, um, you know, like their IoT dashboards as well. So they've tied Amplify to the dashboarding side of the equation. Um, you've got like some, you know, government agencies across the world using it as well. So it's it's really getting out there. Um, I'm actually hoping that, uh, and I might poke, poke focus on it. I, hopefully we'll catch uh, some of those use cases so we can share that back to the community as well, um, you know, over time, because I think that kind of shows the maturity. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited, um, you know, to see what's going to happen over the next six months with it as well um, as it grows even more. Yeah. Yeah, well, all right. Um, thanks, everybody. We've gone a bit over, as we usually do. Um, yeah. You know, it's like, oh, exactly an hour. We've never been exactly an hour. <laughs>
con continue to reach out for us. Um, like last week, we did our um, our setting up a blog for Devs in the Shed. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll share that. Um, and we even our the first post on that is was setting how to how to go ahead and set up like Lightsail and WordPress and go ahead and do that yourself. Um, we got some plans to extend that, so we want to over engineer our blog as much as possible. Um, but there, there are a number I've actually of... got some really cool CDK stuff coming onto the blog if I can get to it in the next day or two. But I've built yeah. some CDK patterns um, to load in existing resources in your AWS environment that you might have click opsed, maybe, um, you know, developed in the console, which is completely fine as you start to scale out. But um, the, the other side of it as well is like loading in your existing CloudFormation. And so how you can reference that within CDK and use that within your stacks. So you can kind of like go from your older like infrastructure's code environment and start using the modern features of like CDK where you can work in your language of choice and you've got like the power of like all the things that are available to those languages to help you build your infrastructure. Yeah. Well, um, thanks, Matt. And thanks everybody, um, you know, for, for watching and being involved and thanks for everybody that contacts us and, you know, gives us some ideas of what to go ahead and do next. We've got a, you know, a big lineup of, of topics and subjects to talk through at the end of the year, um, which is why we tend to be like quite, quite scattered. Um, so, so many different fun things to, to There's probably going to be a ton of surprises, right? Like reinvents my favorite time of the year. Cause it's like yeah. things that we had no clues coming and bam. Okay. Well, like we have to do an episode on this cause this is just going to be too much fun to learn. Yep. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So yeah. All right, we'll take care, everybody, and we'll see you the same place, um, same time next week. Uh, Done. See you then. See, see you later, and see you in my cabin next week. <laughs> Done. Bye. Bye.